Would you stand with me, please, in honor of God's word? This is maybe harking back a little to some of our past, but here we are, and I believe that the pure word without comment is and always should be ascendant over the teaching. And that's why I'm here. I'll be walking down there in a minute. First John chapter 1 beginning at verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Word of God for the people of God. If you, does this thing seem to be working? I don't want to shout at you if I don't need to. Picture that pink bunny we see on a television ad with his big drum and occasionally during my little address to you this morning. Think of it, try and decide how many times he had to put a new battery in that thing. (laughs) How long do they last? When I hide from Jesus, it's usually a, because of conscious and deliberate choices to entertain attitudes lifestyles and choices that are not Christ-like. Scripture says that I love darkness rather than light because my deeds are evil. Sounds familiar. Kind of parallel to our first parents, Adam and Eve. The Lord called to the man, and he said to him, Where are you? And I say in 2019, I am afraid I have sinned, and you can fill in your own blank. How can we reconcile being the children of God and yet repeatedly come down on the side of evil? We covet the earthly and make it our treasure, and it steals our heart. 
such as the teaching of Matthew chapter 6. But our hearts are supposed to belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Are they not? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. That is the first and greatest commandment. Since our hearts do indeed belong to God and ought to give him precedence and rightful first place, how shall we do that? Our cursed sin lays in the way and we are uncomfortable and embarrassed and unlikely to come into the presence of God. But we need not despair. Let us look in 1 John and see perhaps a solution to our, at least what has and can be a problem for me, the hiding from God. This is written to us in order that our joy may be full. In these seven verses, I believe we find announcement, instruction, declaration, encouragement. I say encouraging because the very inescapable sin issue that is our problem leads us to the presence of God. I think here is why I think the problem of sin can bring the solution of enduring fellowship with God and with Jesus his son. great company of past, present, and future saints, the holy commoners who constitute the great universal bride church of God, would you bow and pray with me for just a moment while I kind of get myself back on track here. Father in heaven, you know of my resolve to read. Help me with the delivery of reading. In Jesus' name, amen. Here is why I think the problem of sin can bring the solution of enduring fellowship or companionship with God and Jesus. In 1 John, in the first verse of chapter 1, we find a fellow whom I'm choosing to call John Zebedee. I just get a little mixed up sometimes when I'm looking at the names and the repetitive names of the apostles. And so uh, just for whatever reason, I've chosen to call the guy who wrote the Gospel of John, the Epistles of John, and the Revelation of Jesus Christ, John Zebedee. I think that was his dad's given name, but anyways, that's all I know about him. John Zebedee, he was the brother of James Zebedee. And he was the third or fourth called disciple. Um, his naturalness and his humanity is particularly evident. He was a Galilean fisherman 
And yet, very early in his connection to Jesus, here he is in a boat out on the water and ends up terrified like of his life. He's afraid. Um, and he's out there boating with Jesus. That, John, says, what was from the beginning of this Jesus era, I'm paraphrasing a little here, what we heard, what we saw, and what we examinedly questioned, why we even touched Jesus, who, by the way, is the word of life. And then he has another little parenthesis. Some scriptures have it, some, all of them have it, but not all of them put the parentheses or the bracket around it, but whatever. That In that parenthesis in the second verse, he's saying, the life that I saw demonstrated that the word of life status of Jesus <clears throat> is real. What I saw and heard, I tell you, in order that you can be a part of this, in order that you can fellowship with us, I think the words that are actually there are... that you may have fellowship with us. Amazing, isn't it, that the Apostle John, the wondrous author of the Gospel of John and the Epistles and the Book of Revelation, is not ex an exclusivist. Many of us, if we'd been in that position, I think might carry a like, hmm, I'm on the inside, and I'm not going to share very much of this with others as setting us apart from... On the contrary, John deliberately invites us to fellowship or membership. Fellowship with the Father God and with His Son, Jesus Christ, is invited. John, through his life experience of Jesus and Jesus' love, says that he has fellowship with Jesus' Father also. The way of our Creator God is a way of fellowship. There is fellowship in the heavenly realm. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are revealed in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7 as agreeing about important facts and getting on with their business amicably and cooperatively. Fellowship is a basic human capacity, and most of us crave connectedness with others at various levels and for different projects. It could be a book club, a better business bureau, or a gathering of ex-cons. Rotary, lions, or masons are fellowship, but they are candles compared to the sun when we are invited to fellowship with God, the Creator of the Son, and the Father of the Son, Jesus. John says in verse 4, I tell you this stuff, that your joy may be full, or filled up, or completed. This caught my attention, because it sounds like joy beyond my experience, Strong of the concordance fame, James Strong, he lists rejoicing, gladness, or happiness as alternate translations of the word joy. All of us would likely be voluntary candidates for more happiness, to be gladder, or more joyous. So about this full joy, John says in verse 5, this is the message we heard from Jesus and now tell you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. John's larger writings speak much about light versus darkness, as did Jesus. Part of Jesus' message measured in the idea, God is light. 
In Him there is no darkness, no evil, no confusion, and no cross purposes. In verse 6, If we say we have fellowship with Jesus and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He, Jesus, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, you with God, you with Jesus, and you with your fellow believers, all of us in one fellowship, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In verse 9, If we say we have not... If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. If we go back to verse 7 for a minute... We see that in this, our February 3, 2019 morning service, there is a mention of it. For we are met in fellowship. Mutually, corporately, unitedly, we are here to praise together, to pray together, to be strengthened in a bond of unity and being more being more together than than we ever are as loners or individuals sometimes we fail to value our fellowship enough or we just take it for granted i believe it needs nurture and carefulness. It is my prayer that we may never forget that our great central commonality is at the foot of Jesus' cross. What the blood of Jesus avails us is not more or less for anyone. For all have sinned. We all come. It is a universal inescapable problem. It cannot be remedied except at the cross, and there the ground is level. 1 John chapter 2 begins, My little children, and not because he was addressing kids, but Rather, I think by now John was old and probably felt a little set apart from many of the people and felt comfortable addressing them as little children. They may have come to Christ through him. These things I write that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That our advocate, or intervener, our go-between, is Jesus at one level, is amazing, but it is perfectly undeserved. However, there are no provisos, no ifs, buts, ands, maybes, or notwithstandings. So, Jesus is our intervener. Representation by Jesus Christ the righteous. And He, Jesus, has met His Father's requirements. Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God.
uh, in a dictionary, I looked at the word advocate. I was mindful that Chris, uh, that our church had a position of advocate. I believe Kurt had filled the position. Um, and I had this vague idea, yes, he spoke on behalf of others. Uh, that's pretty much what the Bible meaning is as well. It's one who pleads the case of another, like a lawyer. Jesus is our advocate. Do you believe that God the Father ever forgot the day that His Son died on account of us? How could He? Jesus is the God-appointed man in heaven, still bearing scarred hands, feet, and torso, ever pleading our case. The five bleeding wounds he bears received on Calvary, they offer effectual prayers and strongly plead for us. We sing that often, or reasonably often. Um, taking us back through that whole passage, I hope you're remembering that I was likening it to why don't we fellowship consistently with God? Why can't we maintain a high level of consciousness of who we are, why we're where we are in the Christian context, in the entire summary of our lives? We were called to be the children of God. But that old sin problem, I think there's sort of a perfect circular representation of God. The idea of God's holiness is best expressed in unity or the endlessness of a circle and what's contained within it. It's interesting that our problem is sin. And yet, the solution that God has, the blood of the new covenant of Jesus Christ the righteous, it, our sin drives us to God. Rather than being a problem, it brings us into His presence. We have no excuse for sin after we know that the blood of the covenant of Jesus, the righteous one, is efficacious, that God accepts its completeness, it's, it's, a, it's a done deal. And Jesus, as I view it, kind of cohabits heaven and eternity with God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. God has to be mindful of those wounded, marred hands, feet, and side. It's, the cross of Christ is so central in our Christian faith. I think we ought to celebrate it more. I'm not sure I know how. Apart from fellowshipping with others of like faith and focusing on the, the commonality of it, the levelness of the foot of the cross. And I think it will give us avenues to ministry because as long as we can maintain or avoid an us and them attitude in in any respect at any level in as as we stay true to confessing our sins at the individual level and yet realizing that everyone else that we fellowship with has similar issues and yet 
the solution for them is at the same cross, kneeling before the same Lord. I think it will tie us and bond us, and we will find greater community. This idea of the circularness of I have a problem, I have sin, I must take it to God, I must confess, and I have to do it as all others do, kind of like in the Latin term ipso facto, I mean it just has to flow, it is so, um, that we come into fellowship with God, we come into fellowship with Jesus, and we fellowship with the church bride family. Um, that is part of what is taught quite plainly in your fellowship is with the Father and with His Son Christ and it immediately spills out into the larger Christian family. The, what I deem or choose to call simple solution to our sin is amazingly simple. Our willingness to confess and the rest of it is in God's hands. There's nothing more we can do. I bless God this morning that we can confess, that we can be called children of God just because of the cross of Christ. Father in heaven, we are grateful that the blood of Jesus is so efficacious that our sins are covered there. Help that to sink into us. Help us to ever cling to the cross of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.